There is no doubt that Ontario hospital workers deserve fair treatment. As national president of this union, I fully support their efforts to bring this about. I'm not a martyr, but you know, I can't say if there was meaningful bargaining going on, that would be a different thing. And you, the members, have to make their own decisions. I can't make those for them. And they all have to search their own souls and make that, that decision. But uh, they have uh, the support of, uh, of QP and myself. But your decision is you're willing to go to jail. Yes. As we come marching, marching in the beauty of the day, a million darkened kitchens, a thousand middle offs gray, are touched with all the radiance that a southern sun discloses. For the people hear us singing bread and roses, bread and roses. Like a whole lot of rank and file delegates on a convention floor, the first impression you have of Grace Hartman or of any national leader is someone who's way up on that podium far away presenting reports to convention. So it was really only in the years after that that I came to understand what Grace Hartman really meant for the union and for the women's movement, which was that this was a woman who was breaking completely new ground, literally where no woman in Canada had gone before as a leader of a major union. She was the first woman to lead a major union in this country. Grace was, was a feminist in every fiber of her being, but the book about Grace is called A Woman for Her Time. And what Grace knew very, very well was how she had to carry out that struggle in the 60s and the 70s, which is a very different way than we're able to do it today, right? She couldn't do it like right in people's faces, you know, it wouldn't have worked. The guys would have fought it big time, and they did, <laughs> even when she did it in her own way. So she really, she really tried to appeal to the men in the union that this is about what you believe in. This is about economic justice. This is about fairness. This is about trade unionism. This is about women in the union having the same rights that you do, and try to appeal to their their trade union instincts and their sense of economic justice in order to start taking those first baby steps. That's how she did it. And it was really important that she did it that way. It was the only way she could have done it in that time. Grace entered the labor movement uh, in the days when there was the boys club, and the boys club was running the show. And she had to um, mill about in those, in those circumstances. She would continually uh, push ahead her agenda so that her leadership was one of staying the course, as uh, strong, and yet so personable. When I'm dealing with workers, I think I'm, I'm well keyed, but uh, uh, if I have to be tough dealing with management, I can be tough. The equal pay for equal work was, was one of the early uh, campaigns that uh, Grace Hartman was involved in. Uh, generally speaking, the, the adjustment of the labor movement to the presence of the women's movement has been and continues to be a, a, a serious issue. It's, it's forcing uh, uh, new items onto the agenda for labor unions and for employers and for governments. Uh, and uh, I think uh, has, has infused the labor movement with a lot of energy. Uh, people like, like Grace Hartman were, were in part responsible for that. They're marching, they're singing, and they're proud. At a convention, Grace would uh, organize the floor. Uh, if we had a, a resolution coming up with regarding women's issues, you would see Grace at the forefront of getting the, the speakers to the microphones ready to, to deal with the issue. In the uh, 60s, we organized heavily in the hospital fields, uh, and then the daycares, the libraries came in. What was it about the process of um, the Hospital Labor Disputes Arbitration Act that made the um, hospital workers go out on strike in 1881, injustice. Uh, mainly, mainly the the injustice of the of the collective agreements that they were getting under the Hospital Disputes Arbitration Act. Very few hospitals were signing collective agreements with their employees. Uh, by far the larger majority of our collective agreements were sent to arbitration. The arbitrators at the time 
were not only high-priced uh, people, but they were also unwilling to break fresh ground. For example, the, in the healthcare workers, you would have the cleaner cleaning the hospital. In the school board, you'd have a school board cleaner. The school board cleaner was being paid two, two and a half dollars more an hour than the healthcare uh, cleaner was. Very unfair, very unfair. So all this was just building up frustration, frustration within the, uh, within the membership. And uh, it bubbled over. Uh, it's uh, simple as that. The 1980-81 hospital workers' strike, uh, it, it, was, uh, it was an important issue uh, because the uh, hospital workers, uh, under the then relevant legislation, were prohibited from striking. And the notion is that this is such an essential service that people can, uh, should not be allowed to withdraw their labor. Well, of course, that leaves those people who work in these hospitals, who are particularly the QP members, are people like cleaners and cooks and launderers and janitors and the like, leaves them in a very, very vulnerable position. They're overwhelmingly female, they're overwhelmingly recent immigrants because they're the lowest of the lowest job. They can't withdraw their labor in concert, so their bargaining position is poor. They're forced to go to some kind of arbitral setting to decide what they should earn. The arbitrator, of course, listens to arguments about what the hospitals can afford and what like workers, that is also immigrant, vulnerable workers elsewhere, uh, are earning. And they are also getting screwed, so everybody gets screwed in the process. The hospital is making us work double workloads. They don't want to pay us enough money. They want to take our sick leave away. They want to have make our uh, vacation pay less instead of more. Every now and again, those workers say enough's enough and they just quit. Remember that the bargaining committee in the hospital dispute bargained a settlement with the employer and that settlement was resoundingly rejected by the membership. It's true that QP was trying to get changes to the Hospital Disputes Act at the time to get strike recognition and, and, and as opposed to binding arbitration and we were never successful in getting that, never, with the Davis government and that's the right wing agenda that Davis had. But when the settlement came down, the membership were really upset with the settlement that came down, and the bargaining committee tried their best to get what they, you know, to get what they could with the situation that existed at the day, but the membership rejected it, and the membership told the bargaining committee, "We're prepared to walk out." And I, I, I got to say, the membership took hold of what the issue was then, and they said, "We're going out. It's illegal, but we're going out." When the courts ruled that we were in violation of that act and ordered us, you know, to, uh, to uh, stop picketing and all that stuff and go back to the bargaining table or to their arbitration. Uh, we had uh, then the decision to make and the membership made it for us. The membership said, we'll stay out. And that's where the contempt of court charges came as a result. We've already defied the law. We've defied a cease and desist order. Take it from there. The Labor Relations Board, under that pressure, when in the QP strike of 1980-81, uh, just simply ordered the declaration that there was an illegal strike, and that was obviously true and they then uh, issued a cease and desist order. The cease and desist order, when registered in the court, will have the force of an injunction and lead to contempt. But that wasn't enough for the politicians of the day. They wanted to show that they cared about the patients, and so they immediately took out an, in, uh, an injunction in the courts, as it was taken out by the Attorney General, in the public interest. My interest as Attorney General is, is simply to see that the laws of this province are respected, and so there were two injunctions in the, in the court to prove that these workers, these lowly paid workers, were so essential and they were so willful uh, that they could not be tolerated by our society. In the upshot, the leader of CUPE, uh, Grace Hartman, uh, and, uh, sort of gray-haired uh, grandmother at the time, got a great deal of sympathy by serving jail sentences, being in contempt because she refused to order workers back to work. Hearts starve as well as bodies, give us bread, but give us roses. The president of the Canadian Union of Public Employees, Grace Hartman, was given 45 days in the Vanier Centre for women, jailed for 45 days. Uh, our staff union president, Ray Arsenault, uh, was sentenced to 15 days and uh, 
myself uh, as the president of the Ontario Division, I was sentenced to 15 days. Um, that was for refusing to send our workers back to work. You know, um, she had to make some very, very difficult choices. She was confronted with hospital workers going on an illegal strike and being given advice that said, oh, these workers are never going to walk off the job and, and uh, you know, you don't have to worry about that. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> they did. Um, and when push came to shove, um, even though the resources of the union hadn't been there before the strike for hospital workers, when push came to shove, Grace said, I'm going to be there for hospital workers. And she ended up going to jail for them. We learned as um, healthcare workers how to deal better with our employers than we had dealt with before. We learned that we had to band together instead of being uh, small local unions and small councils, that we had to become a larger entity, that we had to speak with one voice instead of many voices, and uh, we had to translate that into a larger council where we could give up some of our autonomy to that larger council to go in there and bargain for the smaller unions. We did that by creating uh, OCHU, the Ontario Council of Hospital Unions. Grace Hartman certainly was one of the pioneers of, uh, of women rising to important positions in the labor movement. She did it uh, uh, really with her great heart and great uh, courage. Uh, as, as we all know, she, she went to jail for her members. She stood up for them the best way she knew how and created a very vivid impression amongst, uh, amongst the rank and file. I can't say that I really got to know Grace intensely, personally, until very shortly before she died. And uh, five days before she died, I talked with her for a few hours in her home and she knew she only had a few days or a few weeks to live. And uh, we had a few hours together where we really talked about what meant the most in her life. And when I really came to understand what this, what this woman was, up, was, was, was all about and what her struggles were all about, and when we really shared a closeness of an intensity that you can only share with someone where you've walked in a little part of their life, you know, when you've shared some of their most intense life experiences. And that's, that's what I'll always remember the most about Grace was those few hours when she talked about the highs, the lows, the accomplishments, the setbacks, the tears, you know, about being QP's first woman leader. Well, we talked about her going to jail in 1981 after the hospital workers strike and how hard that was. But she also said to me, you know, jail was tough, but that wasn't the hardest stuff. The hardest stuff is the internal fights, the inter internal fights with friends who you disagree with, with colleagues, with co-workers, with staff, the intensely political and personal fights. Those are the hardest. And those are the ones that take the biggest emotional toll on you. Um, so we talked about that. We talked about tributes that had been paid to her that meant the most, like when she was awarded uh, the Persons Award, the Persons Medal, uh, for having been, uh, you know, having really made a major contribution to the advancement of women in this country. Grace Hartman, who was head of uh, QP, uh, got an honorary degree at Queen's. Uh, I had the honor for a lot of these people in the labor field of uh, being their host and uh, hooding them in the academic uh, ceremony. It was uh, always a great reward for me to see these people be honored by the university. It was my very great pleasure as president of York uh, to confer an honorary degree on Grace, uh, more or less the last such uh, degree I conferred at the end of my presidency. Uh, she was a wonderful person. She had a great day. Her family was there and uh, various friends from the labor movement were there. Uh, she spoke uh, She spoke all of her uh, career in, in, in the union movement uh, forthrightly, uh, accessibly, uh, decently, and, and kindly, and uh, really made a great impression on our students as, as, as well as on myself and all the other people who were involved. My meeting with Grace Hartman was at an awards-giving ceremony at the YWCA. 
in Montreal. Uh, the award was to people who had made a contribution to working women. And I got one of the awards. Grace Hartman was the speaker. And the anecdote I remember from there is that, uh, you know, she, she was a tough union leader. And she said, you know, I wear many hats. Uh, I'm a grandmother, I'm a wife, I'm a union leader. She said, the bosses consider me a tough labor boss. She said, but when I'm going from negotiation to negotiation across the country, I need to relax and I knit on the plane for my grandchildren. And people who see me think I'm a sentimental old grandmother. But our friends just think of me as Joe Hartman's crazy wife. Grace had a habit uh, sometimes at meetings to do some knitting, and uh, people took that to be uh, almost an insult that people would come here and knit and not pay attention. Quite to the contrary, Grace, uh, when she was knitting, you knew she had her full attention on what was going on at the meeting, and she was absorbing each and every word that was being said and knew exactly where her position would be at the end of that meeting uh, and articulated it quite well. Grace would be so angry if she were alive today because what Mike Harris is taking away from public sector workers, but from the people of this province, are things that were won in the 50s and the 60s. They were things that were won in the times of Bill Davis. These weren't things that were just won under the NDP government or the Liberals before them. These were things that Bill Davis agreed to. She would be so angry. She would say, I remember when we were at Queen's Park with this bill of wrongs that, were, that it still existed for public sector workers, wrongs that were gradually righted by winning rights for public sector workers in legislation. The right to free collective bargaining, the right to strike. Those rights hadn't existed before, and those one by one are being taken steadily away. The other fight, and this one was in the, in the, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, we were seeing expansion of the public sector. The single biggest attack on public sector workers today is also the single biggest attack on the people of this country and that is the privatization, the cutbacks, the erosion of public services and social programs that in Grace's day were being won and expanded. Um, so there's no doubt in my mind that she would just be railing against what Ralph Klein is doing, what Mike Harris is doing, um, and she'd be there on the picket lines with us, you know, um, and really encouraging people to keep on fighting. Grace Hartman to me represents a leader who had no ego. A leader who listened to the workers, listened to the members, and defended their position in front of the boys club. Faced with all kinds of insults at the, in those days, the early days, and she maintained a stay the course attitude uh, throughout. And uh, she was, I think for QP, Thank God she came along because we are the union that represents the issues on equity, women's issues more than anyone else. And it's because of the seeds that she sowed in those early days. When Grace took over as the president, we were a, a, a good trade union, an honest trade union. But we were not as compassionate as we were when she left us. Grace brought into the trade union movement a feeling for those less fortunate than ourselves. And I think that was her greatest contribution to our union. Grace was a wonderful friend. Um, she was my mentor many, many times, in many ways, during my, uh, my time with the union. Uh, Grace had great compassion for, for people that were less fortunate than herself. Grace came from a very humble background. A lot of people don't know about Grace. Grace was a, a sang with a church group in her early years, and she's been very diverse uh, in her many wo working years. She um, repaired carpets when she first started out uh, working as a as a young teenager. Um, Grace was a good mother, wonderful grandmother, uh, doted on her grandson. Uh, and was my friend. If it was ever true 
that there is nothing that can be taken for granted unless you keep on struggling. It really is equality rights and the rights of public sector workers because everything she fought for is today in danger of slipping away unless we keep on fighting like people like Grace Hartman did before. As we come marching, marching in the beauty of the day, a million darkened kitchens, a thousand middle offs gray, are touched with all the radiance that a southern sun discloses. For the people hear us singing bread and roses, bread and roses. As we come marching, marching, we battle to for men. For they are women's comrades, and we stand with them again. Our lives will not be sweated from birth until life closes. Hearts starve as well as bodies. Give us bread, but give us roses.